and Meg, good morning, everybody. Well, it's amazing to be here at the EMC. Um, it's, uh, it's such an honor for uh, Leanne and I to be here. I want to thank everybody, uh, the whole London church, uh, Michael, Michelle, everybody. It's just a, a huge honor uh, for us to be here. Uh, the, uh, the title of the lesson that I've been given is Zeal to Build My Father's House. Amen. Zeal to Build My Father's House. I'm going to jump straight in. Point number one, tear your robes. 2 Kings 22, starting in verse 3. Today we're going to be looking at the story of the King Josiah. King Josiah was the grandson of Manasseh, who was the guy who sinned, according to the Bible, more than anyone else could ever sin. So that's quite a lineage to come from. Um, I think that it's recorded in the Bible that his son Amon sinned even more than him. And then there was Josiah. Josiah was eight years old when he became the king. Some advisors got together and plotted against King Ammon and killed him. And then the people rose up and killed those advisors and put an eight-year-old on the throne. Because they had convictions. Amen? They said, it is, it's better to have an eight-year-old king than for the people to be without a shepherd. Josiah's 18 years old when he makes a momentous decision. He goes, hey, isn't it true that the doorkeepers have been collecting funds, you know, every, every time people walk in to the temple? Now, the temple at the time was not the glorious temple that King Solomon had built. In fact, now, after succession of, of wicked kings, it was filled with idols. Indeed, there was actually an Asherah pole inside the temple of God. There were male shrine prostitutes inside the temple of God. It was a, a wicked and terrible place. And yet the Bible says here, it says, his mother's name was Jedidah. And Jedidah means ornament of Jehovah. So I think it's interesting that the Bible mentions that. Um, his mother was an ornament of Jehovah. I don't know if that was her real name or if it was a nickname that she got, but one way or another, she raised her son right in the fear of the Lord. Amen. Starting in, uh, in 2 Kings 22, starting in verse 3, the Bible says, In the 18th year of his reign, King Josiah sent the secretary Shaphan, son of Azaliah, the son of Mishalem, to the temple of the Lord. He said, go up to Hilkah, the high priest, and have him get ready the money that has been brought into the temple of the Lord, which the doorkeepers have collected from the people. Have them entrust it to the men appointed to supervise the work on the temple. And have these men pay the workers who repair the temple of the Lord, the carpenters, the builders, and the masons. Also have them purchase some timber and dress stone to repair the temple. But... They need not account for the money entrusted to them because they are acting faithfully. So here Josiah decides to spruce up the temple. He's not making a decision to get rid of all the idols in the temple. He's going to kind of build around the idols that are there and spruce it up for God, even though it was a totally defiled temple. Are you guys with me? The Bible says in verse 8, Hilkiah, the high priest, said to Shaphan, the secretary, I found the book of the law in the temple of the Lord. He gave it to Shaphan, who read it. Then Shaphan, the secretary, went to the king and reported him, Your officials have paid out the money that was in the temple of the Lord and have entrusted it to the workers and supervisors of the people. Then Shaphan, the secretary, informed the king, Hilkiah, the priest, has given me a book. <laughs> and Shaphan read from it in the presence of the king. When the king heard the words of the book of the law, he tore his robes. I mean, things are pretty bad when the only Bible that there is 
is the one inside the Holy of Holies, as Deuteronomy said, they would put a book of the law there next to the Ark of the Covenant. It's pretty bad when that's the last one left. And here, Josiah, to his credit, did want to spruce up the temple. And yet, it was still a temple that was totally defiled in the eyes of God. Are you guys with me? He goes in there, and they find the book of the law. And when the book of the law is brought and read before the king. Now, some people believe, some scholars believe, that they read in Deuteronomy the promises for obedience, the curses for disobedience, and the covenant. And so after reading this, the king, who, who was probably brought up with some love for Jehovah God, and yet did not understand the scriptures, literally tore his clothes. Wow. The impact that the Bible had on this king was incredible. You know, in, uh, in Toronto, we've been having an incredible, incredible time. But I want to tell you the story of uh, a very special warrior of God named Stephen Fraser. You know, Stephen Fraser was one of the guys who was here from the beginning, starting the Remnant Group here, and stayed on after the mission team came, planted the church, and has been an incredible brother, and I know is very well loved to all of you. But I just want to say how grateful we are that you sent Steve Fraser to us. Amen. He has been an indispensable part of the team. Amen. I remember when Steve tore his robes and joined the new movement. Yeah. When, he, when he read, uh, when he listened to that, that, that sermon, The Great Light Has Dawned. Yeah and touched base with us and, and joined the new movement with Ali and, and Jason and the rest of the guys. And yet, Steve was not just a guy who tore his own robes, but Steve is a guy who's been getting other people to tear their robes again and again and again, and is now doing it on the other continent. Steve, Steve is not the most extroverted guy in the universe. Are you with me? And yet, um, in Toronto, Steve is a guy who has found ways to reach into people's hearts and present God's word to them. Shaphan read the words of the law to the king, and the king tore his robes. You know, Steve, who's, who's perhaps not, as I said, the most extroverted guy in the universe, what he did, he said, you know what, I, I, gotta, I, I gotta do my best out here in Toronto. We're a tiny mission team of 10 people. And he goes on and he starts this thing called, this, this little website, uh, meetup.com. Yeah. And through his little meetup.com Bible talk, downtown Toronto on Thursday at, at noon, he was able to invite out this, this woman named Bernadine. Bernadine comes out, and Steve had asked me to come and, and lead the Bible discussion. So I went and I did sort of like a, a kingdom study. And as we're going through the kingdom study, this woman, Bernadine, I, I was like, oh my gosh, like either she's a Bible scholar or I, I don't know, but it's like she knows the kingdom study. <laughs> and as, as we're talking, you know, I said, where, where, do you, where, do you, where do you study the Bible? She goes, well, many years ago, I was baptized into a church called the ICFC. <laughs> and I was like, oh my gosh, you're, you're my sister. And I, I, I gave her a hug, and she's like, wow. And, and as we went through the study, literally, I mean, it was incredible to see the transformation that happened in her in one meeting. She then reaches out to a bunch of her friends, one of this, this other couple called the Narcissos in Calgary. And she goes, hey, uh, I've met this guy named Steve. He's got this little Bible discussion uh, you have got to get in touch with the leader of this church. And so through Steve, through Bernadine, we got in touch with the Narcissos. Wow. The Narcissos came to the inaugural in Toronto, got with Kip and Elena, who showed them the book of the law. Are you with me? <laughs> they, they tore their ropes. They went back to Calgary, sold their houses, packed a moving truck, and moved to Toronto. Yeah. 
But, but not only that, they, they reached out to everybody they knew. They said, you've got to move with us to Toronto. Come on. And a young man, a precious young man by the name of Delray, who uh, was actually uh, Bernadine's nephew, who worked as a, as a dishwasher, said, hey, you know what? I got nothing to lose. I'll come with you to Toronto. They studied with him for five days in the moving truck from Calgary to Toronto. And about one or two days after arriving, we counted the cost, we did a couple more studies, and bang, Del Rey got baptized. <laughs> Steve has had an incredible, incredible impact. He's been an instrumental member of the church, and I'm very grateful to the London Church for sending Steve <laughs> to Toronto. You know, the Word of God has dramatic impact in people's lives yep. if you let it. Yep. Here, Shaphan takes the Word of the Lord out of the temple of God, brings it before the king, and reads it to the king, and the king tears his robes. Yeah. Are you tearing your robes in your personal Bible study? Are you getting other people to tear their robes in your Bible talks, in your D times? Come on. Come on. Without the Word of God, nothing can happen. Right. Nothing can happen. You know, I love, I love the principle that we see in, in Romans 10, 17. Yes. The Bible says that faith comes from hearing Amen. the message. And the message is heard through the Word of Christ. Yes. That's, that's how you get faith. Yes. Biblically speaking, miracles, oftentimes we can think miracles give us faith. Mm -hmm. But in fact, millions of people who have seen miracles right. yeah. have not been faithful. Right. Real faith comes from preaching the word of God. Amen. And the Bible says that when you hear preaching of the word of God, you get faith. When you get faith, what can you do with faith? You can move mountains. Do you want to move mountains in your ministry? Do you want to see incredible miracles happen in your ministry? Then preach the word in a way that gets people to tear their very robes. You know, um, not only here did... did this king tear his robes, but he literally searched around for a prophet. He said, is there, is there a prophet left in Jerusalem who can, who can go before God for me? Is there, is there anyone left? This brings me to my second point, grind the ashes. In 2 Kings 22, verse 15, here they find a prophetess. And the king doesn't go himself, but he sends some messengers and he says, hey, ask this prophetess if there's anything that God wants to say to me. Check this out, verse 15. She said to them, this is what the Lord, the God of Israel says. Send, tell the man who sent you to me, this is what the Lord says. I am going to bring disaster on this place and its people according to everything written in the book of the, ki the king of Judah has read. Because they have forsaken me and burned incense to other gods and provoked me to anger by all their idols their hands have made. My anger will burn against this place and will not be quenched. Tell the king of Judah who sent you to inquire of the Lord this is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says concerning the words you heard. Now, this is, this is trippy. Because she, she literally was not in the room to see the king's reaction at all. And look at what she says here. Because your heart was responsive, and you humbled yourself before the Lord when you heard what I've spoken against this place and its people, that they would become accursed and laid waste, and because you tore your robes and wept in my presence. Can you imagine how like scary that would be? You're talking to this prophetess who wasn't even in the room. 
And she goes, this is what the Lord says. I was watching you. I was there. I saw you tear your robes. I saw you respond to my word. And because you did that, I have heard you, declares the Lord. I will gather you to your fathers, and you will be buried in peace. Your eyes will not see all the disaster I'm going to bring on this place. So they took their answer back to the king. Wow. They find a prophetess. The prophetess says, hey, God was right there. God's been watching for your response. And because you totally humbled yourself in my word, because, because you totally humbled yourself, yeah. the consequence is, I'm not going to bring this punishment down in your lifetime. Come on, bro. You're not going to see the horrific destruction that this land and this people have earned. Can you imagine? I mean, you just finished reading Deuteronomy 28 and 29. These are heavy-duty scriptures. And you're thinking, We're, I'm toast. We're all toast. My family, my wife, my children, everyone I care about, we're, we're done. And then you get this message of grace. Because you were humble, because you responded, you're not going to see this. This is going to happen sometime after you. What's the king's response? Well, in chapter 23, starting in verse 1, the Bible says, Then the king called together all the elders of Judah and Jerusalem. He went up to the temple of the Lord with the men of Judah, the people of Jerusalem, the priests and the prophets, all the people from the least to the greatest. He read in their hearing all the words of the book of the covenant, which had been found in the temple of the Lord, the king stood by the pillar and renewed the covenant in the presence of the Lord to follow the Lord and keep his commands, regulations, and decrees with all his heart and with all his soul, thus confirming the words of the covenant written in the book. Then all the people pledged themselves to the covenant. Wow. The king here gets, gets struck by the grace of God. And what does he do? He gathers all the people that he has influence over. Isn't that what happens? Right? When you really get hit by the word of God, the severity and sternness of God, but also God's mercy and grace, when you get hit by that, what do you do? You gather everybody you have influence over. You get everybody you know. Now, it just so happened, he's the king. So who does he have influence over? Everybody. He gathers everybody together. And together, he reads the word to them and gets them to the place where they also join him in the covenant. He doesn't, he doesn't then go on with his little piddly sprucing up the temple. What's recorded in the Bible here is one of the most zealous, incredible, restored, restorative campaigns in biblical history. Come on, Sam. The Bible says there was never a king like him before or after. Literally, he takes the Asherah pole out. He takes every idolatrous, nasty little thing out of the temple. He burns them. The people are like, hey, everything's burned. Take a look. Here's the, here's the pile of ashes. He goes, take those ashes and grind them down. Can you... I mean, there's a big pile of ashes. There's probably a few chunks and maybe a little face of an idol in there or something, a little something, something left over, a little piece of metal. He goes, grind it all down. So then they grind it all down, and now it's like there's nothing recognizable. Then he goes, get your wagons and take those filthy ashes out of my city. They take the ashes, they pile them up onto the wagons, and they get even the ashes of the idols that were in the temple of God out of the city. When we really have a zeal to build our Father's house, number one is we grab every person that we have influence over. We even reach to those people we don't really, we just barely have like a little little toehold with them, we even reach to those people. Yes. We pull them in, and what do we do? 
You want to build the Father's house? It's not about sprucing up the wood and the carpentry and uh, working on a little bit of stonemasonry. you got to pull out every single idol. Yeah. But you can't leave people in their ashes. You know what I'm saying? People can, can, can burn the idols, but there's still little parts left. Yeah. you got to grind that even down. Yeah. And then they can be sitting there kind of in their ashes. They've, they've even ground down the little bits. But they're, they're still filthy with the, the soot of their consequences of their idolatry. You even got to take that stuff and get it out of the city. If we want to have a zeal for building the Father's house, the zeal has to be about destroying the idols that are in people's lives. Amen. It's about the heart. Yeah. It's about the idols. So many people, they walk around, they go, I'm not, I'm not feeling zealous. Yep. Come on. I, know, I don't know what it is. Is it, is it my minister? Is it, is it my discipler? Is it my husband or my wife? You know, you ever, you ever have somebody break up with you and they go, uh, hey, it's not you. It's, 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 this is not about you. This is about me. When you're not zealous... It's not about me. It's about you. Yeah. Come on. God doesn't come to you and go, hey, you know, this is not about you. This is about me. God goes, no, this is not about me. <laughs> this is about you. Yeah. Come on, Tim. If, if, we don't, if we don't go after those idols with all of our heart, with passion, with great zeal and energy, come on. Come on, taking the idols out of people's lives yeah. and grinding them down, there's no way to spruce up the temple of God. Are you guys with me? You know, um, Josiah was a great king who did awesome stuff. He uh, tore his robes in the presence of God. He ground down all of the idols. And yet, when we take a look here in 2 Kings 23, starting in verse 29, the Bible says, Well, Josiah was king. Pharaoh, Necho, king of Egypt, went up to the Euphrates River to help the king of Assyria. King Josiah marched out to meet him in battle, but Necho faced him and killed him at Medigo. Josiah's servants brought his body in a chariot from Medigo to Jerusalem and buried him in his own tomb. And the people of the land took Jehoahaz, son of Josiah, and appointed him and made him king in his father's place. Wow. This guy was an awesome dude. He rediscovered the Bible. He spread the message to many people. He did incredible things. He destroyed all the idols. And yet, in 2 Chronicles, it goes into a little bit further detail. He got hit by a random arrow in the neck. That was my last point. Zeal with an arrow in your neck. <laughs> we live in a broken world. We live in a broken world. And just because you discover the Bible, and just because you destroy all the idols, doesn't mean you don't still live in a broken world. This is, this is serious. Because many people think, I became a Christian, so now everything's going to be awesome. No, you can still get an arrow in the neck. You can still get an arrow in the neck. And you still got to be zealous with an arrow in the neck. Anybody can be zealous for a little bit, of, little bit of time. But can you be zealous with a few arrows in your neck? Can you keep that level of zeal? In all, in all seriousness, as a movement, we've taken a lot of arrows in the neck. Uh, in, in Portland recently, in all seriousness, we took a, a devastating arrow in the neck. An amazing couple, Fred and Tiffany Sokolov, uh, with their beautiful little girl, were driving to uh, the, the marriage retreat. They're going to the marriage retreat. They want to work on their marriage. And coming around the corner, road was slippery, car goes out of control, they get hit by a camper. And that couple, with their baby girl, were instantly killed. We were all devastated. Devastated. It's, it's two weeks later. Nobody's recovered. 
the, the, the devastation is, is unbelievable. And yet, the Bible says we have to be always zealous, keeping our spiritual fervor serving the yes. Lord. Th this couple took a terrible arrow in the neck, yes. like King Josiah. Yes. We're all going to get arrows in the neck. Yes. We all have arrows in the neck. We're going to take a few more. And yet, we can never lose our zeal. Brothers and sisters, we're in a war. And it's a war for zeal. I would like to call it World War Z. And, and in this World War Z, it's not a war to never get hit by an arrow. It's a war to keep your zeal even when you get hit by the arrows. I love you guys very much. Thank you.